All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining me today uh, for a quarterly Anthem Sightings Brand Square. Um, if folks aren't familiar with Anthem Sightings, it is a quarterly document that we publish on sightings and trends in marketing, branding, innovation, and design. And I'm Kathy Onetto. I'm Vice President of Brand Strategy here in our Anthem San Francisco office. And uh, it is live, as you can see, not only myself, but folks walking by behind me. Um, in our office. Um, but I'm going to be speaking with you today about brand building, alive, well, and absolutely essential. And one of the things that we saw in uh, this last quarterly Anthem sightings was more of a broad trend if we put some of the things that we were seeing together. And what was interesting and frankly compelling and uh, something that we were really excited to see was that despite the fact that we've been dealing with this global recession um, and despite the fact that many brands have had to move to pricing and trade promotion tactics uh, to really drive top line growth, that we were seeing a number of brands who were actually um, you know, really investing in brand building. And so it was encouraging to us to, to know that brand building was alive and well. And frankly, from our point of view, being a brand development agency, of course, we would say it's absolutely essential. So what I'm going to speak to you about today are several examples where brands have been leveraging their equities um, to build their brands from the bottom up, from by leveraging their unique assets, by telling their stories, and then by also going back to their roots. So let's go ahead and get into these. And, and one of the things that I might encourage all of you to do as, as you're listening um, to these various examples is perhaps think about the own, your own brands that you work on and think about, you know, are there some unique equities and assets that you have for your brands that perhaps you might be able to start to leverage even more strongly into the future? So let's start with this first one on um, building um, uh, from the product up and about making um, unique product features, indelible product features, making them truly yours um, so that consumers really associate these product features with your brand. So while there definitely ha are successful um, examples in the marketplace where brands have built unique product features into their products and that consumers then really continue to associate with their products ongoing, um, there are a few examples uh, where this has been successful. You know, the, the one that most people would kind of think of might be the Tiffany box or the other one that we're showing here on the top, which is, of course, Apple's white headphones. You know, if somebody um, in the early days when iPod was first launched saw somebody um, at the bus stop or what have you with white headphones in their ears, they didn't need to see the device. They just saw the white headphones they immediately knew that that individual was using an Apple product. Similarly, there's a brand called Moleskin, which um, if people are familiar with them, they produce um, leather bound uh, notebooks and they've been expanding this brand. But one of the things that all of their notebooks has is this elastic um, band that helps close, close the notebook, keep it closed. Um, well, as the brand started to expand into new notebooks and messenger bags and things of that nature, and you can see those examples on the left-hand side on the bottom, um, they uh, brought those into those new features, that elastic band that now when people see that product without even knowing that that's um, you know, they might not see a Moleskin brand name, but because that feature is there, it already starts to get me to think like, huh, I think that might be from Moleskin. It's a brand that I trust. Um, that's a product feature that I quickly identify with them. Um, and without having to see the brand, I can associate it with it. Now, those are two examples where success exists, where they have done it well. Um, and it's not even all just about doing it well. It's just it's not easy necessarily. So take these two shoe examples where on the top, I don't know if people are familiar with these shoes, but these are MBT shoes where they um, claim to mimic um, walking barefoot. And this was um, a smaller company that came out with these, and they started to have quite a lot of traction, at least here in the States that I know. And um, they have a unique look, and also people look, um, frankly, a little odd walking in them. So 
they, they definitely, just from their feature alone, start to have an attraction and you might associate them with the brand. Um, but because of the quick success of these, you actually had uh, folks like Skechers and Reebok come out with their copycat shoes, which looked very, very similar and also started to eat at their share. So it wasn't so easy for MBT to hold on to that. Now take a look at the bottom shoe, which is in stark contrast to that, um, certainly not about a healthier way of walking, but these are beautiful Louboutin shoes um, that have a classic, their classic red sole. And what was interesting about this example was that at the time of our sightings, um, Louboutin had just lost their patent on having this red sole. So the patent office actually said it was too broad of a trademark, that they would not be able to own this type of a thing. Um, so, you know, some who are familiar with the shoe and certainly are, are, are fans of the shoe still might associate that particular characteristic with it, but it's not something that Louboutin certainly is going to be able to own. So, you know, we believe that these are, um, you know, things to really think about in building your brand equities. These indelible product features really can become great brand equities. Um, so it's, it's important to think about them even when you might be launching a product from the start or building a brand from the start and creating that element that can truly be owned even if it were to be copied. Sometimes things get copied and uh, a brand ends up building, uh, a competitive brand perhaps ends up building your brand instead uh, instead of trying to build their own brand um, themselves. So uh, a quick little snippet there, it's just we'd advocate, again, building in those unique product features um, that really can be owned by your own brand, um, such that even when people just see them, they, all, they instantly know it's yours. So now let's move on to this next example, which is about um, mastering equities and really leveraging assets. And this um, particular example is a little unique for us because we don't typically cover just one brand. Um, and I'm going to be talking about Danon. But um, you know what we were seeing from Danon across its portfolio of yogurt products um, was, was something that was distinct. And actually, a couple of examples that were coming up right at the same time that we, they were, we were seeing them execute across their portfolio. So many people around the globe probably know Danone, and certainly uh, it's called Danon here in the United States. Um, certainly they have a broad breadth of yogurt um, products as you see on the screen here. Um, really within the, at least in the United States, Danon has what we would call two core master brands. And I'm going to tell the tale of these two master brands, right? So Danon is one, but they also have another Stonyfield um, that is, uh, has its equity in the organic space as well as in corporate social responsibility. Now, Dannon has owned a stake in Stonyfield since 2001. So these are equities that they they have in their portfolio that they can make use of. And what was interesting to us was that they were starting to use these two equities um, as endorsers on the same driver brand. And I'll explain what I mean as I, as I get into these examples. So the first one is on Activia. Um, so probably many people around the globe are familiar with Activia as a brand. Um, it actually took quite some time for Dan and to bring Activia to the United States and to figure out how to talk to Americans about gut health. Um, but they finally launched the product about six years ago. And when they first launched, you can see the product up at the top, they, they started with what we would call Activia being the driver brand. And what we mean by driver brand in this case is it is the core equity that is being used to, to provide um, equity to this proposition. It tends to be the most prominent brand on pack. And instead, what they, um, what they did, well, not instead, but in this case, when they first launched, what they did is they launched with Dannon being the endorser. Now, Dannon, uh, just this past June, decided to launch an organic version of Activia. Now, one way that they could have done this is they could have just on the top um, pro you know, product, um, and when they went to go design this, they could have just added an extension modifier. They could have said it's Activia Organic from Dannon, um, as an example. But they didn't choose to do that. Instead, they looked at their portfolio. They said, what is the brand that we think has equity in organic? It's clearly Stonyfield. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to launch this with an endorsement from Stonyfield and um, position it more as organic in that, in that regard. Um, interestingly, too, it might be that they've chosen also to shelve this actually within the organic set and more so um, have it be associated with Stonyfield in that regard as well. 
So interestingly, the product is first positioned as organic, and then secondarily as being made with Activia's probiotic cultures. And I even found an article with Activia them, or Dan and themselves were speaking to it in that regard. Also interestingly, on the bottom skew, you actually see from a design perspective that they're, they're more so equally weighting those. I'm calling it an endorsement from Stonyfield, but it is a little questionable, like which is the equity that's really bringing the most to the party here? Is it Stonyfield or is it Activia? Um, but for sake of argument, let's just say it's the same driver brand of Activia, but now with two different endorsers on the product. So that's the first example. Um, and again, it's interesting because I don't think you see this in the marketplace very often. Um, the next example I'm going to speak about for Dannon is around um, the Greek segment. And, um, you know, interestingly, Dannon was not the brand that entered the Greek segment uh, initially. It was actually Stonyfield. And when Stonyfield launched, they actually launched this as a distinct driver brand um, called Oikos um, without any endorsement. So you see that packaging at the top right, um, I'm sorry, on the left-hand side of the screen, but at the top. Um, and that's how they launched. They didn't launch with any endorsement. But interestingly, within two years, um, you know, Stonyfield changed that. And I think that could be because, you know, they may have thought when they launched starting with a more distinct name that actually communicated Greek um, was going to be a stronger proposition in the market. But, but they may have found that needing to create um, a lot of equity in another brand was quite costly. Why not go ahead and leverage the equity that we have in Stonyfield and provide that endorsement, especially around the fact that we offer a distinct organic uh, Greek yogurt? So you can see that in the middle image that they that they changed that. And then finally, more recently, um, with some other design changes that they did, they, they redesigned the bottom package you can see there. And just to avoid any confusion, they at least have kept certain equities similar from the package design standpoint. Uh, the Oikos font has stayed fairly similar. And they've kept, um, you know, while they changed the um, how, how prominent it is, they've always had this seaside image on the left-hand side now on the bottom um, that they've kept on their brand as well. So hopefully to avoid confusing consumers. So now this Greek segment, at least in the United States, has been growing significantly. And it's actually caught some of the, the larger players off guard a little bit. And you actually have Chobani, which is in the upper left, a smaller yogurt player, as well as uh, Faye, which probably started the the trend here in the United States, as I'm, and I know is offered abroad, um, you know, the Greek, the traditional Greek yogurt, um, which is in the bottom right, they really are the top two competitors. And so, of course, Dannon um, and others being such prominent yogurt um, players needed to get into this segment. So now when Dannon first entered the segment, they entered with um, Dannon being really the driver brand and frankly just having an extension modifier of Greek. You know, they're not going to build equity in Greek alone. Really what they're using to drive the equity in the proposition for this brand is the Dannon, uh, the Dannon brand itself. Um, but interestingly, just again in September, October of this year, they've redesigned and they've relaunched um, within less than a year and a half of their initial launch. Um, so they launched the top SKU in 2010 and now already already in September, October of 2011, they've relaunched this. And they're relaunching it using the Oikos brand and now keeping that Dannon endorsement. Now, Dannon themselves claimed or said, which I, I think is, uh, I can certainly understand, um, one of the reasons that they did this was that retailers are starting to say, hey, this is this growing segment. We can't have so many brands on shelf. You know, we're going to have to uh, skew rationalize. So by only having one Greek brand of Oikos, um, Dannon can kind of simplify things for the retailer, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, but we could also conjecture that they did this because, frankly, Oikos is the number three brand, Greek brand in the segment and that Oikos um, is actually a better equity that they have in their arsenal of equities to bring to this particular offering and also to bring some consistency and strength um, across their line. So again, we have a final example of yet another brand that they have in their portfolio, Oikos, where they are using two different endorsements, um, one organic version with Stoningfield and one here with the Dannon brand. So what's the lesson for marketers here? I mean, first, it's really know your brand equities, 
what's their value and meeting in the hearts and mind of consumers. So you, you can really treat these equities as assets. Treat them as assets so you know where you can deploy them across your portfolio. And frankly, the other thing here for a lesson I think um, that Dan and his demonstrating is don't be afraid to switch it up. If you find that you're learning in the marketplace that something isn't quite working, um, you know, don't be afraid to, to switch and test and do something new. I'm sure Dan and did a lot of research before they made this change. Um, they also are putting significant uh, marketing support, be, support beyond, uh, behind the Oikos uh, Dan and launch. Um, but you know, it's, it's great to see that we believe in this, in this world uh, that we're living in today that you need to be action oriented with your brands and be able to be fluid and um, be willing to change. So it's great to see that, that Dan and was willing to do that. And I think is a good lesson. All right, so I'm going to try to go through these next two a uh, little more quickly. Uh, so the next uh, example is around telling brand stories. And really, um, the beauty of uh, what we're going to talk about is journey telling. And it's about being more transparent with consumers about um, your product development stories. And it really taps into the, the overall trend that we've been living with for some time now, which is that consumer desire for authenticity. So what is journey telling? Journey telling we coined as uh, the idea of breaking down the walls between a brand's product development teams and consumers to directly share a journey that was once reserved for insiders only. So there are a few examples of this. Three of these are actually uh, retail brands. And um, the first one that we'll talk about is J. Crew. So J. Crew um, created a series of short documentary style installments called Made in Italy, where they followed around their brand development team and specifically uh, Jenna Lyons, their creative director, um, in Italy as she searched for materials and worked with vendors there in Italy and actually talked about, here's what we want to create in terms of our shoes, our suits, our blouses. And, you know, what's really wonderful about this is that, you know, it really provides consumers that inside look as well as that strong proof point that, you know, hey, these products really are made in, in Italy. And look at the attention to detail um, and the quality that this organization is putting into their products. Um, so, Really interesting case study. Um, similarly, anthropology, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with anthrop anthropology, but you know, one of the things about anthropology that makes it such a unique and wonderful um, retail experience for, for those shoppers who really um, enjoy it is that you find unique items within their store. Not everything is cookie cutter, things change year in, year out. And so they, they highlighted this by actually following um, their buyer at large, Keith Johnson, around, and they created did this series actually with the Sundance channel called Man Shops Globe. And uh, they followed Keith around as he shopped and found these one of a kind pieces. And what's really wonderful about this is that, you know, consumers can now actually go into their stores, believe that these items actually did come from a unique place from around the world. And if they're lucky, they've actually were able to find out the story behind that particular item um, that they can now tell as they go um, and try to tell these stories or maybe share that item in their own home. Now, Gap has kind of just stepped into this uh, type of um, uh, journey telling experience as well with a um, program this fall called uh, around their denim studio in LA, um, their 969 denim studio. And what they did is um, it's kind of a whole marketing campaign that really started with print ads that directed people to a Facebook page and really brought people into this experience of this denim studio, introducing them to the design team and also sharing with uh, consumers and shoppers, um, you know, the philosophy that Gap has around producing and creating denim. So it was an, an interesting way for Gap to start to enter uh, this type of journey telling experience as well. Now, the final example, is shifting gears a little bit, is uh, to talk about Chipotle, which is a, uh, a Mexican grill. Um, and Chipotle, this is a little bit different in that they're telling um, their story instead, not with real people, with, with a fictional character, but with a very compelling animated story. So it's slightly different, but still supports the same idea, which is trying to support their product development, um, what they believe about the products that they um, make and the ingredients that they use. So. Um, 
obviously we have just one shot here, but if you haven't seen Back to the Start, we suggest you look it up on the internet and really watch it. It's quite fun and compelling. And it really reiterates Chipotle's pledge to integrity, sourcing local high quality ingredients, and humanely raised meat products. Essentially what this story tells is the story of a pig farmer who you see there who really starts to grapple with the kind of traditional methods of producing meat today. And so he pledges in this, in this movie um, to, to do things differently and to become more of a locally sourced uh, meat producer. So really compelling um, and interesting and certainly had a lot of viral attention. So what, so what are these examples really doing? One of the things that they're really doing is, is, is leveraging hidden proof points that they have um, by actually exposing themselves and letting people into their process. And in doing so, it really does help to differentiate one's brand from competitors. And it feeds the consumer's desire to connect and for truthfulness and transparency, as I mentioned. And it, it's really be, these behind the scene glimpses can really strengthen these equities. It really provides consumers like, oh, okay, that really does come from someplace around the world. Oh, there is somebody who cares so much who's going to Italy and making sure that this is made in a particular way. Um, so something for you yourselves to perhaps consider in terms of the thoughtfulness that you might put into your own product development and might want to showcase that. So we'll move on to the final um, example here uh, and final brand building story. And this is really about going back to a brand's roots. And I'm going to talk about two brands um, that have been doing this. So I'm going to talk about Levi's and um, Lacoste. And you know it's so difficult for brands to really remain relevant over time. And if you think about Levi's, they've been around for over 150 years. And then you have uh, Lacoste that's been around for uh, over almost 75 years. And it's really from their past that these two brands are starting to reinvent themselves. So both brands had tremendous success, but both brands also faltered a little bit. And now that it's from their past that they're starting to reinvent themselves and they're really using their history as an asset unto themselves, unto itself, rather. So we'll start with Levi's. I'm sure most people know Levi's um, and, uh, you know, it probably is, has a little bit of a soft spot in our, our hearts because it was founded here in San Francisco during the California Gold Rush. But the key thing to really kind of make note of is the fact that when they first um, launched or first uh, was were founded, you know, Levi's was these denim jeans were really about providing solutions for the working man, for those manual laborers who are going out into the fields and trying to strike it rich, um, searching for gold. And Levi's had tremendous success, um, so much so that they almost became this iconic Amer American brand around the world. Um, but as the brand entered the 21st century, it really started to lose relevance as we all got enamored with our $200 jeans um, and started to look, you know, the fashion market around jeans was shifting and, and Levi's wasn't able to keep up quite as much. And so they saw their profits drop and had a bit more um, challenges in a, for, for a couple of decades. But they've really been able to start to turn this brand around. And one of the ways that they've turned the brand around is, again, to go back to that past and go back to that association with workers. Um, one of the ways that they, they've done this in three ways. One is around their product. One is around uh, a campaign. And then finally, a final is around initiative, which I'll touch on briefly. The first is their workwear series. And those were products that they um, developed that were really focused on workers. And one of them that's showcased here is their commuter line. And you can see the jeans at the top where, you know, they built into these jeans, you know, people who are, for, it's for like bike messengers and folks like that, but actually might be commuting on their bike. Uh, the jeans at the top, you know, you can see that a lot, they had a place for a lock to hang on these jeans. They're water resistant. They have um, tape on them that is uh, uh, that showcases the light um, and, is, and is reflective. Um, so these were these were product lines that were directly uh, produced, um, really keeping these types of people in mind. Now, from a campaign's perspective, um, part of their Go Forth campaign, they had a, um, also this ready to work campaign, again, focusing on workers. And you'll see the middle picture here showcases the mayor from uh, Braddock, Pennsylvania, which is actually where one of um, Andrew Carnegie's first steel mills um, was placed. And, uh, you know, 35% of the population in Braddock is um, under the poverty line. So what Levi's did is they went in there and really wanted to um, 
showcase getting people back to work and supporting this community. And they partnered with them and did a series of documentaries um, and mini series where they where they talked with this community and they invested in the community in a community center, a library, an urban farm um, to really showcase these people um, trying to get back to work. And then the final one um, that Levi's is doing is they've done these Levi's workshops where they're, you know, almost showcasing more manual laborers, if you will. And I, I say almost uh, non-white collar, if you will, um, folks. And they've gone into communities um, and they just took this global this year going into Berlin where they've gone into communities and have offered workshops. And these are free workshops um, around things like photography, fil film and printmaking, as you're seeing here, um, in providing uh, those, those workers a place to learn. And it's, this is the first year that we're seeing Levi's, their profits and their, uh, and their sales uptick. So it's exciting to see them kind of reinventing themselves by going back to their past. Now, when it comes to Lacoste, uh, they had a similar history just in that they were founded by uh, Rene Lacoste uh, way back when, who was a tennis player. And he started by providing these quality clothing that were more comfortable and breathable on the courts. Um, but during the 1980s prep era, for those of us who remember that wonderful time, you know, the shirts became ubiquitous. And this entire time, I've been trying to keep myself from saying IZOD. Um, and so that tells you, too, just how brands got confused. Lacoste also stretched itself a little bit too thin. It was being sold across um, too many distribution points, and it really lost its cachet. But they've been able to turn the brand back around. And part of the reason they've been able to turn it around was that they um, you know, have limited distribution. They've been very choiceful about where they've had that distribution. And then they've gone back to their roots. Again, they've gone back to sponsoring athletes, um, such as Andy Roddick. Um, and they've been putting their brand very thoughtfully in places where they want to be, where it emphasizes that premium quality and that uh, prestige that they want. So they've been doing, as an example, some uh, uh, guerrilla marketing where they're uh, outfitting um, hotel staff and restaurant staff in their, in their clothing uh, at high-end restaurants in places like Manhattan and the Hamptons. Um, so they're making sure that they stay um, close in, but they're also going back to their roots and making sure that they're honoring who they were um, at the beginning. So what, is, what can these guys tell us? So if you have a brand where you might need to be rethinking it or uh, reinventing it, perhaps building from history is a good place to start. So start by recalling your roots, really understand what made the brand great to begin with. And remember that with expansion comes risk of losing meaning. So of course, once you start to reinvent it, you're wanna, gonna wanna continue to grow. But just make sure not to expand too quickly. And then when you're ready to expand, just do it very wisely. Levi's is a good example where when they went to extend, they did it closer in and made it very meaningful to those consumers who might be using them today. So with that, and I realize I may have gone a little long here, um, you know, all of these examples show none of them are pricing tactics, none of them are trade tactics, not that those shouldn't be a part of your brand arsenal, but really these were great examples of how all these different brands were building um, their equities to really uh, build their brands for the future and invest for the future. So these brands and equities live and give back um, to the brands and the business over time. So now those were just a few of the examples and sightings. Um, you can see up on the screen on the right-hand side that there are a number of other articles in there, and we have started to do sightings in briefs so that if you don't have time to read all the articles, you can kind of get some shorts and hopefully some quick learnings. Um, and up on the screen on the bottom, hopefully you can read that there, that you can download the report at shock.com in our Knowledge Center. Uh, so feel free, if you haven't had a chance to look at that yet, to, to check it out. So as I said, I know I went a little long here, and I'm probably speaking fairly quickly, but I'm happy to try to answer any questions that anyone might have. All right, well, I have one question um, that came up, which was, how would you suggest going about creating ownable product features? Um, you know, the first place I would start is really understanding for one's category, um, what are those important features that are going to really drive purchase intent? And, um, you know, oh, our lights are going out. <laughs> um, uh, sorry about that. Uh, 
you know, so start by understanding what are the product features that are really important to your category and see whether or not that's one of the features that you can make an indelible mark and part of your brand. I'd also consider um, whether or not it's something you could build IP around. Another idea is just going back to some of our examples are more even things that are simply noticeable. You know, part of I could argue that Apple's headphones are not the best headphones out there for one to use, but they certainly are something that was identifiable and noticeable. Think about the Tiffany's box as well. Um, so that's another place that I might look um, for those product features. And I would also just encourage at least think about it. <laughs> think about it when you're developing your products. And if you have the opportunity to create a brand from the start, certainly think about that as you're building your brands um, and your equities. Okay, one other question here is, um, how should a company best leverage all the brand assets within its portfolio? Um, you know, I think one of the first things is just, frankly, to make sure you do have a portfolio strategy. Make sure that you are managing your brands as assets. Um, the second thing I would encourage is if you don't understand um, each of your brand's assets and equities, and then also understand their range architecture. How far can I stretch my brands? Um, where might there start to be overlaps? Or where might there be complementary places where I might be able to leverage brands together? Um, or even consider when you might need to bring out in an outside partner to fill a gap that you might have. Um, so that's another key thing to consider. One example I didn't mention earlier that I think um, you know, one company that does a great job of this, of course, is P&G, but with their Febreze brand, they've done this very nicely where they've used Febreze on everything from, you know, Tide to Downey to others to, um, because Febreze stands for these scents. And so they've done a nice job of being able to really leverage those equities um, across their portfolio because they understand what they mean and how they might be able to leverage them across their mix. So this final, maybe this might be our final question. A few of these examples speak to um, changes a brand makes. Does a brand have to be concerned about me making dramatic changes? You know, I'm, I, the way, of course, I'll answer this by kind of saying it depends. But, you know, one of, the, one of our beliefs is really that brands um, really do need to be kinetic. We believe in kinetic branding at Anthem. And um, because of the world today, the world that we live in, it demands action. I think consumers demand action. So we actually encourage brands to be able to move and change and make sure that they're engaging consumers in relevant ways um, always. You know, it's kind of an always on world right now. Now you need to do that intelligently and by having strong brand equities and, and ensuring that you have those equities, it really starts to give you permission to have um, more flexibility to do some of um, that kinetic activity. Um, but of course, you know, you need to wear, uh, uh, balance the risk and reward and determine how much testing do I need to make, uh, you know, have uh, on something before I might change uh, or make a dramatic change. Maybe one final question, or uh, if there isn't any, that's fine. We can also we can also finish up. All right, I think we're good. So thank you again, everyone, for for being with me today. I really appreciate it. Um, if you have other questions um, that I wasn't able to get to, or if you have any other questions about sightings, um, I'll just provide my email address. It's Kathy K A T H Y. Uh, dot Oneto, O-N-E-T-O, at anthemww.com. So thank you again for being with me today. I hope this has been helpful, and we'll uh, look forward to seeing you at our next Brandsquare. Bye-bye.